Why do you love being in front of the camera? I think really I became an actress and a vlogger because I'm getting the attention I didn't get when I was a kid and I knew I deserved it. I knew I had a lot to say and I could say it in a really cute way. And I knew right away that I was um, uh, different. First of all, because that's what they told me. My mother said, you're, you're, you know, in, in Yiddish, it was uh, which translates to you're going to die alone. Um, oh, <laughs> no one will ever uh, think you're normal. Like she'd say, you're not normal. And I'd I'm not, uh-oh, not normal. People don't have friends, they have cats. I mean, lots of them. Not that I'm against cats. I love cats, dogs, everything. But I, I want to be friends with humans. I also, I want to be able to, to work and have a job. So I have to prove that I'm, I'm not crazy, I'm normal. Well, I saw what my mother and father paid attention to, the television. So as a kid, I knew just be on TV, People will watch you. Plus, people on television, especially if they were pretty, had great credibility. And, you know, after being told you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy, and in Yiddish, which makes it a lot worse, your whole life, you want to prove you're, you're, you're normal. And being on TV makes people, even crazy people, look less crazy. And I knew I could express my opinions, and there I had the audience. So it was just a matter of, like, how was I going to be on TV to express who I was, especially since I was a terrible auditioner? I really sucked. I would have been a huge star if I were able to not lose my mind in every single audition that I had a line in. Uh, it was funny. I could always get the parts when I didn't have lines. That was easy. But uh, there was something uh, that just said, do it right, baby. Just, you got to do it right. And I think I was trying to audition the way I thought that the person who would actually get the part would do it, which takes every, all the creativity, all the put yourself into it, out of it. And I was just trying to kind of, and, and I was so insecure. I, I was um, almost like uh, every, I start every audition with, I'm sorry, can I start over? And um, <laughs> let me just let you go back to your work casting the real people. And I, I'll go back to driving back home out of the valley. And when I came to LA, uh, I was 21 uh, from Montreal. I'm like, car did not have air conditioning and so what well, most of the auditions were in the valley and I would schwitz and I, I kept uh, failing at auditions and and I, I, I was working at um, the IHOP because you know working on my acting skills like acting like I didn't want to kill myself at the cashier yeah. cash register I couldn't even make change someone would give me a 20 I'd stand there and cry you know it's like horrible but I went through all that because I I knew one day I would succeed if I just didn't give up. I was reading like Napoleon Hill and all these like self-help books because as an actress, you get rejected for a living. And, and then um, unfortunately, I was me too into a state of depression that I'm still <laughs> recovering from because every once in a while, some uh, horrible thing will happen, uh, show biz related, man related, and the trauma just comes back, you know? And uh, so I have to deal with that daily too. So I had a lot of um, very uh, negative experiences when I, I came here not just losing my self-respect. I mean, uh, I, I, I came here to be on a TV show. Um, I, I, my parents bought me a car where we were living in Montreal and I said, thanks. And I drove South made a ride at Ohio and then just came right out here because I was going to be on this show. And it turned out the show happened, but without me. And so I, I, I was, uh, I saw it all happening. The producer apologized and, um, I got drunk. And so instead of getting into show business, I got into hard drugs and I got sober December 28th, 1982, but who's counting. And so I've been alcohol free and it was, a, a, a journey back to well, be the reason you drove here, Hanala. If you were to write a letter to yourself, 
on that drive from Montreal to Ohio, then to California, what would the first paragraph of that letter be? <laughs> I would say, turn around because Montreal is about to become Hollywood. <laughs> You don't have to go anywhere. And then I would say, but knowing you, you really want to tan and you want your hair to look better because Montreal is very humid. A lot of people don't realize it's a island in a river, a volcano really. Very, very humid. We didn't have air conditioning. I learned to suffer. I learned to have a lot of heartbreaks in uh, Montreal. So I would say, I know you want to get out of Montreal. I know you really, 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 really want to go, but I don't think you're ready. You're too sensitive and the show's not going to happen. Of course, she drive here anyway. Even if you had read that letter, if someone had read, if someone had written that, you would still have driven. Well, I, I think that I had a real passion to do this and, and I would, uh, uh, I don't think that I could have understood possibly how uh, I wasn't uh, capable of handling what was going to happen. I guess I would have had to tell her, you know, you're, you're, you're going to um, be fed some drugs and then you're going to wake up with a naked man on top of you. And you're going to make it a joke. Like, what is this naked man doing on top of me? You know, like, I can't figure this out. But um, it's not a joke. It will affect you forever. And it will affect your self-esteem so much that you blame yourself and you invite more of the Me Too experiences into your life. And um, that it's going to be a life of a lot of rejection. So maybe you want to like stay home a little bit longer and trust me about this Montreal turning to Hollywood thing. But staying at home, being told you're crazy from, from the people that I've known that that's like their go-to line. Usually they've come from a lot of trauma themselves and that's how they kind of keep people in their place from the people that I've met that that's like their running dialogue that so would that really be an option? Wouldn't it be better to come somewhere new and get away from that? Uh, <laughs> there was I there was a safety to being in school. I, I could drink more responsibly. <laughs> I did a lot of well, I was in theater, so we did a lot of drinking. Um, I remember descending this staircase. I had the lead in the play, and. Uh, they built a very high staircase and even when I wasn't drunk, it was high. And so I was waiting backstage for my first entrance and the whole cast backstage, they were holding their breath, wondering if I was going to fall. And I'm like, Oh, isn't being on stage scary. And they're like, shh. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm going to hit my mark. Okay. I got to go upstairs. Stairs. Okay. You shh. And like, so I get to the top of the landing and I'm looking back and, and the rest of the cast is up there going, <laughs> and I'm like, what is I'm so relaxed, right? Cause I'm so drunk. And, uh, I, I hear my cue. I open the door and I'm absolutely perfect. You see, I live with my mother and I was a drunk and an, and a drug addict. So I knew how to like act. I was an actress. I could act straight. So I, you know, I was already pretty much of an alcoholic in Montreal when I was doing all the, the plays. Well, no, bef I started uh, on the theater, on the stage when I, Yiddish theater, when I was very little, like four years old. So I, I wasn't drunk then. And I, I do remember the experiences and being terrified. So I think that whether I lived in Montreal or whether I lived in Los Angeles, I would still become a raging alcoholic and drug addict. Which came first, your sobriety or starting the cable access show? Oh, I started my cable access show because I got sober on December 28th, 1982, 4 p.m. if you're counting, and I 
count it every minute at that time, because I wanted people to understand what it's like to live without killing yourself. I didn't think I could get sober. I only got sober because my husband said he was going to leave me if I didn't get sober and I was an agoraphobic and I lived through him. So if he left, my life was over. What was I going to do? Well, hope for a FedEx guy to come by, you know, <laughs> depends on what he looked like, I guess. I <laughs> yeah, but you can't count on that. No one was sending me packages. <laughs> no, I'd lost everybody. The, certainly the trust of everybody including my mother, unfortunately, the Holocaust survivor. I felt so bad, both my parents being Holocaust survivors, and here I am throwing my life away, but I, I did the best I could. Um, what was the initial question? The initial question was, which came first, getting sober or the cable access show? Oh, right, right, right. So, so when I was, uh, well, nothing could get me sober, you know, I, on my own. Uh, so when I, uh, he threatened to leave me, as I said, and I, I couldn't have that. So I said, well, you know what? I said this to myself, not to him. I'll go to one AA meeting and I'll talk about it for like a month. Because my mother stretched a five year war into a 50 year story. I knew how to do this, okay? So I, I, I thought, okay, so I'll get my stuff together. I almost drank on my first, uh, on the way to my first meeting. Cause I, well, I, I, I felt I merged better on vodka. Wrong. That's delusional. I know. <laughs> so I thought it was inappropriate. So I didn't have the drink and I was shaking. Like I said, agoraphobic. So just leaving the house to get the mail used to make me shake. And now I'm driving from the beach to West Hollywood and so I'm like this, but I got there and that was my first meeting and I sat down. I've been sober ever since that was my last drink of alcohol. And I thought when I got sober, I thought, who do, people need to know about this. So, um, it just so happens I was in a building with a public access studio. So I actually saw one, but didn't think anything of it. But then I read in variety foreign actresses wanted. And I answered the ad and I said, listen, I'm from Canada. It's kind of like, is that really foreign enough? And she said, Oh, come on down. <laughs> so I did a show and they all said in the studio afterwards, you should have your own public access show. I went, Oh no, no. What am I going to talk about working out? Cause I've become an aerobics instructor and, and sobriety. And I created shape up LA and it was on for 15 years. And then I turned it into when I heard about this new thing called YouTube, I'm like, Oh, please. That's us on steroids, right? So I, I said, I know how to do this. So I uploaded in 2006 and almost 400 million views later, like, what? so I, like I said, I knew one, um, one PR company uh, told me, you know, you're, uh, we can't, we cannot call you a doctor or a therapist because you all you are is like a sober person with a lot of great advice and, and, uh, you know, what can we call you? And so we came up with life coach in the eighties and then it caught on. So in 1984, I think it was, I was on my first TV show, uh, doing shape up LA, which then they asked me to be on other shows cause I wasn't doing uh, shape up, uh, Nebraska, you know, was, <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew where to do my show. And, uh, so I, I got on a lot of other shows and, um, I did movies. Thank goodness. Uh, one of the reasons I did this show is because seriously, I, I suck at auditions. So one time my agent called me and said, in the breakdowns, they want a, uh, they want, uh, okay, my t at the time my name was Susan Stadner, but that's a whole other thing. That's before I took back my Jewish name and got married. But it, they said, the agent called and said, there's a breakdown, in the breakdowns, they, they're looking for a Susan Stadner type. So he sent me in, I didn't get the job. Because they wanted the Susan Stadner on Shape Up LA, not the one who sucks at auditions. So that's why I, the show just had to be the audition. I did get a lot of work. Like, um, they used my show starring me finally in a, sh a movie called Ruthless People starring Danny DeVito and Bette Midler and a lot of other really good stars. And 
I was the person, I, they let me write all my own lines. Like I wrote, uh, squeeze your thighs. If you don't, no one else will, you know, <laughs> or squeeze your butt. Anyway, I wrote all the lines in there. It was about like, ooh, ooh, four more. I wrote that. But uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun to see my show with a much better set and better lighting. And as a matter of fact, I thanked um, David Zucker, the, one of the producers, directors, writers, brilliant, wonderful, love you, David. Um, I asked him, I, I told him that I, uh, I wish I had this gorgeous set for my public access show to shape up LA and it was all sparkles and colors. And he said, well, if you can haul it away, you can have it. But like, I didn't have a backpack big enough <laughs> or a crew because it's public access. So, but um, it was it was an experience to watch that. And then I did a zombie movie. I played an aerobics star too on a TV show. The zombie uh, is so mesmerized. He lets the lead get away. I'm, it was a pivotal role. <laughs> more, more of the four more kind of things. But so I, I became known as like the actress you hire who plays an aerobics instructor. As you can see, I just let myself go. Not, right? Because you never know when the next job will come up. You changed your name from Susan to Hanala. How did changing your name change what you do creatively? Is Susan still there? Is Susan a memory? Changing my name was um, something that happened one thing at a time. <laughs> People don't, like, why'd you go from Susan Stadner to Hanala Seagal? Well, it's a little bit of a story. When I wrote my memoir, it was called My Parents Went Through the Holocaust and All I Got Was This Lousy T-Shirt. It took 10 years to write. It was 800 pages. Oh, wow. And then I took out the blame and then the commas. <laughs> And then what was it? What was the page? It, uh, 400. But I added pictures. I, I'm an illustrator, an artist. So I was able to always, ever since I was a kid, I have all these cartoons that express how I feel. And I'm actually quite good. I, I have uh, this ability to draw uh, someone just like they look without having them there. I use a picture. Anyway, but uh, no, I, I do, uh, I, I can do portraits. But I, um, um, I went through such a process over the 10 years of writing that book that I think I became a different person at the end. And when my mom came to visit um, toward the end, uh, I didn't finish it until after she died, uh, unfortunately. Uh, We, well, what happened was we were at the airport and she looked at me with tears in her eyes and I was already crying and she was saying, it's not like I'm dead. I'm like, no, you're going to Canada. <laughs> but she said, she teared up finally and she said, oh, you look just like Hanala. And that was her sister. She said, oh, the people that come from the other village just to talk to Hanala, just to talk to Hanala. Damn, I can't tear up yet. Okay. So um, I went home, got on the treadmill, still crying. And uh, when my husband at the time, that was two husbands ago, if you're counting, um, and I said, Pete, I want you to call me Hanala. And they're like, <laughs> why would you watch now? <laughs> and I explained it to him. And he said, okay. He finally, about three years ago, started calling me Hanala. It took him a while. He's a stubborn guy. So Hanala was a name that like, my therapist got right away. And she was all behind it. Yay. But then I became um, Seagal when I married a Seagal and became an American citizen while legally married as a Seagal. So to unsegal myself would have been very difficult and expensive. <laughs> so um, you might say, well, why not just get rid of the name? Well, I don't believe in throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and I love the straight A's, Hanala Segal. And it is pretty, because otherwise it would have been Hanala Stadner, which 
doesn't seem right to me anymore. So I've been a Hanala Seagal for years now <laughs> and it fits, it's gentle. And when I was a little girl, my mother didn't call me Susan. Uh, she, uh, well, actually, she, it, that's how she called me when she was angry, Susan. But I never heard Hanala angry. It was always Hanala. Oh. Hanala. Hanala. Oi, Hanala. But it was never like Hanala. Although my sister, um, you know, everyone has that sister. Uh, she, she tried to ruin it for me once, too. I told her that I hear Susan the way she used to say it, which tends to be like, Susan, 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 which I didn't need to hear in my head anymore. So uh, when I told her that, she went, Hanala, Hanala. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's so like her, which is why we don't really talk. What I loved about watching trailers and reruns of your cable access show that you have on your YouTube channel was the comments that were also the, how people really related to you and they felt a, a kinship and they wanted to call because back in the day, of course, there were no you know, YouTube. And what was something that someone said that you, it, it changed you? One of these messages, oh, something positive. I had, I had a father uh, call with a heavy Middle Eastern accent. And he said, oh, well, I have to back up. I did a show where I wore a little girl dress with crinolines and my hair was up in pigtails and bows. And, and I had a face that could pass, you know, for a little girl. And it was so cute and aw. So I talked as if I were an adult explaining what it's like to be shamed by adults and the trauma and how it's hard to really believe in myself. And I hear no so much. And, and it's always like when I'm in my most excited that I get yelled at, oops, I forgot to watch and how it makes me like shrink into myself. And, and, and I don't understand when I'm being hit, like what I could have done and how I could, I'll do it better. I, I don't know what I've done, but I'll do it better. I'll do it. I won't I'll stop, whatever. But I did it all with comedy because my comedy wellness brand was started back then. I just didn't know it was called a brand, you know? So um, this, this man said, when he watched my show and it was like 22 minutes, it made him understand what his children went through when he yelled at them and when he hit them. Oh, wow. And he was determined to change it. And I knew that it's hard to stop doing a show, even though it doesn't pay you nothing when you get calls like that. And also, oh, um, okay. So I'm, I don't know what, like 25 years sober at the time. And I'm at a meeting, I'm speaking and a woman follows me in and she's like, can I talk to you? And at that point I'm like, is this about my ex-husband? Oh no, this is happened a few years ago. <laughs> Cause that women have stopped me to tell me, oh, don't ask dash and dying. Don't ask. Anyway. So, um, so she said, no, I just need you to know that my husband and I used to watch a show while we were on crack. And, um, and then one day we said, we should try a meeting. And they've been sober ever since. So it's like I planted the seeds and I did it with comedy because that's how I like to learn. I like to laugh. I don't want to be, I don't want to be lectured. Um, if you can make me laugh, you have me, you know? And you wrote the book, um, that now will be turned into, it'll be adapted into a movie called Trauma Land. When you wrote the book, um, it was all comedy based as well. You were trying to make light of a serious situation. Yeah, but I, w I was too angry and resentful to make it really funny at first. <laughs> I needed, I needed to release a lot of that. Like I said, release the commas. Um, <laughs> but then, uh, um, the shorter it got, the funnier it got. I was trying to make a, a comedy wellness reduction sauce, you know, just, <laughs> just bring it in to just the, the, the yeah. Condense then, it. Yeah. yeah. And the screenplay, that's where it's, I call it a comedy, just a dark comedy because, um, the, whenever it gets like heavy, there's a big laugh right after. I don't want a stressful movie. And because I'm able to make it funny, uh, it was just a matter of like, you know, what actually moves the story along and what is the funniest. That's what remained. And then, then you get your actual, because yeah, we do in the movie, uh, we flash back to my parents in Poland and my most 
disgusting and pathetic alcohol years. And although there's nothing funny about the Nazis, my mother and father, especially my mom, she had a way of like, I, this is me. I, 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 Ma, did you just make that up? And she said, yeah. And I go, oh, I have to write that down. <laughs> That's how she was. And so we used those little gems. And my sister, who we talked about, who, you know, we, we are not close, did say something that almost made me like belch. <laughs> she said, she thanked me for the writing, writing the book. She said it brought Ma back. So she read it over and over again just to make my mother come alive again. Though I did, my mother was so in my head, it's, it, it was kind of hard. Ma, me, the, the difference of a vowel, you know? So it was kind of hard. Yeah, the, she has a very distinct voice, which is why casting the movie is going to be interesting. I wonder who's going to end up playing Manya because this darling Holocaust survivor who's so just so bright and adorable and she was really my inspiration and that's why I wanted to change my name back to her sister who died in a gas chamber which is one reason I changed my name from Hanala to Susan I forgot to say I was born Hanala not Susan oh. my sister looked at me and went oh let's name it Susan Hanala is way too Jewish and you didn't want to finish the book while she was still living no I very much wanted to oh, finish did. it <laughs> I so much wanted to finish it um I I uh she gave me the finish uh, we were alone in the hospital um but I won't go there because I will definitely cry and give away the uh of the important scene. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how many times you've pitched the idea for trauma land and, and, and what was the response and then why now? Uh, um, I don't think I would have finished the script for trauma land had I not had this track record with Elvis and Nixon. Um, starring Michael Shannon and Kevin Spacey and people talk, I used to say Kevin Spacey and Michael Shannon, by the way, um, if they don't know, it won the Tribeca 2016 centerpiece. That's like the prize. So based on that, I was inspired to do this, uh, to finally finish it. I've been working on the screenplay since the book came out. Oh, trying to have, adapt 2006. Oh, oh, that's so many. 700,000 drafts. So, <laughs> not really, not really. Uh, but it just oh. felt that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's a, a lot of drafts, a lot of, so, but, but uh, just starting over too. Just, and what I would do is I would take like master classes, screenwriting. I'd watch Film Courage. I'd get tips. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, especially um, when it came to writing a synopsis or summary, I actually, I would watch your channel. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was part of that work we integrated. So and actually used. Absolutely. So, um, and here's what happened. Um, other people seem to believe it too. Like, wow. You wrote and co you co-wrote and co-produced uh, Elvis and Nixon. Now, the truth is that I had been uh, given this offer that if I could complete a really good script about the meeting when Nixon met Elvis, uh, I could uh, actually perhaps get it produced. So I had a deadline. So for 30 days, uh, first of all, back then, this was about uh, five years ago, Six, six years ago, maybe, what I did was I, I had to order the DVDs from Netflix to research this meeting that Elvis had with Nixon. I didn't know anything about it. So I saw all the, uh, the people who were there talk about it. And one of the, the guys that I, I saw was Jerry Schilling. And he said he was there for the whole meeting. And I went, and the whole trip and everything. It was a really interesting story. And I also read Priscilla Presley's book and that changed everything. That gave me motive. And so I, I thought, I got, I got it. I don't want to write a screenplay about dead Elvis. Boo hoo. You know, I liked Elvis. I, I don't want to write, well, yeah, it was a, that's a tragic end. So what I did was I had just written two screenplays that I never even bothered pitching because I thought they were getting produced and it fell through that were buddy flicks. And I went, I'm going to do it about Jerry. 
And that's how I came up with the idea of how to format the screenplay and everything. So I, I wrote the screenplay and then Carrie Elways wanted uh, to direct it. And then he added a, a little bit and became one of the co-writers. But I'm the one who, who fleshed out that story. I'm very proud of it. So I'm glad that we're able to use that to get us to the next level with Trauma Land. That's why I finished it, because I had a feeling that people would pay attention to a produced screenwriter. Elvis and Nixon took you one month to write? It was a challenge? For, it's a one month challenge? Uh, well, I think I think that all in all, from when I started the first page, yeah, it was it was a month, and we had a director at the time, so I would send him my pages every night, and I found that was helpful too. Oh, yeah. so he was almost like a sponsor, like a yeah. accountable. Yeah, okay, every oh, night. Nice. Wow. I couldn't take a day off oh. because Ryan was expecting a page or two, and I was inspired. Plus, I found out I really love. Right, putting words in men's mouths. <laughs> okay. Get in there. Stay in there. Use them. <laughs> so I, um, I, I enjoy writing for men, uh, men's roles. And so that was like more fun for me. Like I said, I'd already warmed up on two other screenplays. And um, I felt like I knew Elvis. I was already doing Elvis songs. Like in my band, I Sing Suspicious Minds. And I was born the day Elvis got his first gold record and he recorded, I want you, I love you, I need you. Is that the way it goes? I'm dyslexic. It's one of those. It's <laughs> all, all of them, but not necessarily, necessarily in that order. So um, I, I, I think that as a fetus, I heard Elvis and then my parents never had air conditioning. So the windows were open in the summer because I was born in April. Okay. And so I think um, I was born into Elvis. And so I, when, when it came to writing him, and also I had uh, the Elvis impersonator behind me. Sure. I really, really, really want this badge. <laughs> and, um, the, so I, I enjoyed writing it. It was actually so much more fun than writing about the Holocaust and alcoholism. I cannot tell you. Did you watch a lot of, of reruns or tapes or whatever? You know, like, um, I mean, YouTube was... When, when were you writing this? YouTube was around was then? This was 2011. So YouTube was around. Yeah. yeah, but it didn't have any, uh, YouTube did not have anything on this uh, no. meeting between Elvis and Nixon. Interesting. Maybe a couple of videos, maybe a couple, but I had to, uh, uh, I, w I had Netflix at the time and they had the, uh, the DVDs, the, the DVDs mm -hmm. from the National Archives. And also I heard that the most requested photo of the National Archives was of Elvis and Nixon shaking hands in the Oval Office. So it's like, okay, so that became like a big part of it. And with the dialogue, when you went back in for revisions, were you cutting a lot of it down? Because you know how Elvis had a very specific very specific way he spoke, and so did Richard Nixon. Oh, we yeah. had a lot of different drafts. I kept writing it and writing it, and then what happened was I never knew if it was going to get produced. Even though I was being paid uh, option money, you, kn you don't know. It could have gone away. And then one day I get a call, <laughs> you know, that it's get getting made. So it was like years between, and I had no idea, right? But about three three years maybe, after I wrote it and totally given up, except for the option money, I decided to submit it to a film festival, the Page Screenwriting Festival. And I got notified after submitting that there were 5,000 entries. So like I stopped checking the emails. And then one day I get a phone call and they say, aren't you interested that you've made it into the finals? And I'm like, but I, I'm blocking your emails now because it was spam. Like, no, we were trying to get a hold of you to tell you you've been in the quarterfinal, not quite, I can't even say if quarterfinals, final, semifinals, finalists, whatever, however it works again, dyslexia. But um, yeah, we, we made it into the top 100 and it did, we didn't win, but it was a finalist. That script. And I'd been working on it the whole time. So that's, you know, uh, like not with the other two guys, that was just mine. But I did put their names on it because I had to, you know, they uh, at one point did put in a word or two, I guess. <laughs> so 
I um, uh, I gave up on on all of that after the uh, the thing didn't win, and didn't touch it again. And then I got the phone call that Kevin Spacey's been cast, and uh, the movie's a go. Why do you think most people fail in Hollywood? Most people fail when they come to Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, well, I have to say. Uh, Obviously, there's um, a delusional factor where you really think it's not going to be as hard as it actually is. And I don't know if uh, it's because humans are maybe um, we're inspired by uh, attraction and like w w we see what being a celebrity attracts, they're very attractive, they're bright and shiny and they play roles, they play instruments, you know, like I want to play for a living. So they, uh, the people who strive for it don't have a real idea of uh, the hard work and tremendous luck involved to being one of the few that actually make it. So uh, they're setting themselves up for failure. And that's why, um, I thought I was always a very practical person. And I thought, well, if I'm going to work regularly, and I can't seem to audition well, I better create a public access TV show because it was before the internet. And then once the internet, my own YouTube tool to use, that was one of my tools. Another one was to uh, write a screenplay that I was able to act in. Although on Elvis and Nixon, the role that I wrote for myself uh, was given to another actress who had a big social media following. Oh. And knowing that that stuff happens, unfortunately, and it's devastating, why do you think some people are able to pick themselves back up and continue on? If some people get mad and say, I'm done. If the system's rigged, I'm going, I'm driving back. I did have, when I was working at the International House of Pancakes, acting like I was okay with it. Uh, I did have a recurring nightmare that uh, I was being shot every night. There was a regular customer who'd come in and, um, and I was wondering to myself, why am I showing up for this? <laughs> and when I woke up, I called my agent and told them to throw away my pictures and resume. I was done, I was done. And now, um, at this stage of my life, I can tell you I'm done with being done. I've quit quitting. I can't seem to quit. Uh, if, if, if there were a way, uh, I, uh, when YouTube came along and I started getting millions of views a month and then millions of views a week, it was like, yes. And so I went full on, you know, I'm going to just do this. And of course, uh, the views have dropped down, but that was inspiring too. It gave me my own venue. But if I were to do it for the money, I would quit too. There's no money in it. Although I do get residual checks, but why the government would take six cents out of my 12? I don't know, but I do get residuals as you can see. What's the best year you've had in Hollywood? I thought the best year, I actually did a YouTube video saying 30 year overnight success, <laughs> uh, thinking that Elvis and Nixon was going to be the best year. Here I'd uh, written this amazing screenplay. It was uh, nominated and won awards and starred big stars and all that. I thought, thought that was going to, and it was actually one of the worst because I didn't um, understand although I've made it a joke in the past, how writers can be treated. And uh, it was just not a happy experience at all. However, uh, one day I'll be able to watch the movie and truly enjoy it, but not yet. So was that your worst year? Because I was going to ask you what was your worst year. You thought it was going to be your best. It, that's why I guess it was the best of years. It was the suckiest of years. Yeah, um, so both are true, and that seems to be the yin yang, the real thing. You're, everybody's got something. I don't know anyone who's not dealing with something, and that was my something. And I think that's what you know. I tell, I I would have told my myself in a letter to my young self, it's always gonna be something.
and don't take it personally. Uh, you're going to get calls from the big producers shaming you and telling you, who do you think you are? You're going to get those phone calls. Don't get it. Don't take it personally. It's men doing their thing to stop you from doing yours. It's always men. Did you get any? I'm, I've had a call from a few agents that said, oh, well, who agents. do you think you are? They yeah, but now you're not yeah. talking man or woman. Now you're talking career. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh that's occupation. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's yeah, gender neutral. It, it would be. Oh, yes. Interesting. Yes. And uh, so <laughs> I, <laughs> I think that uh, there's also other things I would tell her. Uh, very important. See people for who they really are, not who you wish they were. Because this is a town of people who will tell you what they think you need to hear in order to get what they need from you. So uh, I would tell her to, uh, uh, before Google, because this was before, hell, it was before laptops. Um, I would tell her, you're, you're, it's, it's a, a, a town full of people who will misrepresent themselves and check people out and don't trust anyone. Be 80% less Canadian and 20% more FBI. And Canadian is? Oh, hey, you wouldn't hurt me because I wouldn't hurt you, eh? We're all in this together. Sure. I hurt you. That's like hurting myself. Well, that was a little... I'm from southern Montreal. It so slips in. I can't believe I forgot how to do... I spent 21 years in, in uh, Montreal, and now suddenly I can't do the accent anymore. Eh? And FBI is guilty until proven innocent or well in this town uh just know that people do take advantage uh i was told by my first photographer let's just call it a headshot session where he told me after he took the pictures that all the girls do this after and i'm like not ain't B, you know, like all the girls, all of them. But um, at that point, you know, he had already given me something and a glass of wine and I was happy to do it because I was already freaked out that I wasn't on that TV show I drove here to be on. So, yeah. Do you think Me Too will still exist in this current age now with this generation going forward because now we're bombarded with it every day on Twitter, somebody new is being called out, male or female. Well, I know, I know someone who absolutely hates the Me Too movement because it changed the way they do business. And I'm like, okay, anytime anything is new, there's going to be growing pains. And, and right now it's all like getting adjusted as to what's proper. However, now that women and girls and boys are given the words to use, like, that is not appropriate. Put that back in your pants. You know, <laughs> it's like, before we didn't even have, that's like, oh, it must be me. Was I wearing a, like a, a short skirt? I mean, even though we know it's not, the typical thing is, uh, I was raped. Oh, what were you wearing? I mean, that's where we're coming from. So uh, do I think it's gonna change overnight? No, but these people who are being, uh, and, 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 and as someone who's been assaulted, if you're being sexually assaulted, you're being assaulted by someone who is able to objectify you and not think of you as a person. And so if you are quiet, you are complicit. So not that you brought it on or not that you let it go on. Just know that you have to be a champion. You have to be the hero right then and there and say, if I don't speak up now, no one will. And I have a right to, no matter if they bought dinner. Rape is definitely not okay. <laughs> not, not, not at all. But then there's this other element which feels like sort of the elephant in the room in Hollywood. And that is what if there is, you do this for me and I do this for you. Well, the casting couch has always been there. Favors, you do favors for people. There has to be that line of not sex. It just can't be, you know, it's, uh, 
it, it's hard to change the paradigm. What if somebody thinks they're different? I've got to do this. I've got to get this part. The, the one thing I see about this town and having been young, growing up, not in, in the industry, but then coming here at a very young age with not a lot of guidance, is I saw a lot of people like myself that were very hungry. They would have done anything. Mm -hmm. And I see sometimes they're still hungry and well, they're in their 30s, why, 40s and, and That's more. why it's up right. to the industry. They can't, it can't be offered. You know, it's sure. like, dude, you know, don't be one of them. Yeah. You know? Um, get your sex elsewhere, get your thrills elsewhere. But I mean, for, for, for women or men, because it's happening to men as well, what would you tell them that they think that they'll be offered something if they just do this and they're willing to live with that? They're oh yeah, if, you know, if you're willing to live with that, you know, if you're willing to, I mean, there are people who have sex for a donut, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I would never, I never say one, one case fits all. Sure. However, there has to be you know, something that we expect and something that we don't expect. And when the don't expect comes in, we're like, I know where to take that. I know how to report sure, that. Sure, sure. If it's, you're waking up and then yeah, yeah, but it's otherwise, horrible. I mean, horrible. it's like psh, case by case. Right. But do you think we're still in that, in that arena now that there's been so much? So many people have. I, I would imagine people are more afraid to whip it out these days. If you laugh, life is what? Oh, <laughs> well, here's, I, I live by laugh. Uh, love, acceptance, understanding, gratitude, and honesty. And that's basically, I believe that uh, laughing is what will save your mind. And it's also great ab work, like singing. And uh, acceptance is the, where you basically pick what's important to you and you accept what you can't change. And then of course you go and change what you can that you can't accept. And uh, understanding I find would take a lot of the hatred out of uh, what's going on today with society. If people understand um, the concept of like cognitive dissonance, uh, which makes a lot of people, uh, they're not open to discussion and to changing their paradigm. And what they do is they defend and push away. But if you understand what's happening and uh, uh, insecure, angry people are easy to brainwash and it's a lot harder to convince someone that they've been fooled than to fool them. So if you understand that, you're less likely to be as angry when you're dealing with what's happening today. And gratitude is remembering that we could be dead. I always think of Carrie Fisher went through my drug rehab um, decades ago, like 20 years ago or something. And she was exactly my age. And I know that she didn't stay sober. She just couldn't. And I always think about that could have been me if I'd still, still be doing the Coke and the, and then I also think about how, uh, I never killed anyone. I drove drunk a lot. Cause like I said, it, you know, helped me merge <laughs> and, uh, I didn't want to, I thought only bad people drove under the influence, but then I became one. And again, that was, you know, a, a war inside me. So I drank more, but then I, you know, I was able to actually get home. Uh, I'd always be shocked how my car was parked. And I, I, so I, on days that are really hard for me now, I think about that, that I never killed anyone. Cause I, being the codependent Canadian, I'd never get over that. I mean, and neither would they <laughs> or their families. So, um, uh, uh, so just being grateful that I'm not, uh, an alcoholic and an addict uh, destroying my life and others. And um, honesty, I have to be honest with myself or, or else I, um, I'll really blow it. I'll get nervous and anxious um, if I try to bury red flags. Um, they will be buried up my butt and that hurts. And so I've got, I've got to look at them before they go up there. 
Okay. So right? let's laugh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> What's the most painful thing you went through as an addict? The most painful thing I went through as an addict? Wow, which one? I have to go back into the Rolodex. Does anybody remember Rolodex? I do. Yeah. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. um, I would, ha the first thing that popped to mind, seeing as we're in therapy, um, and that's how this goes, <laughs> uh, I, I have to say the having to drink before a phone call and feeling so alone and feeling like I was going to blow every opportunity and I was never going to reach my potential. And that was something that I would feel daily because I couldn't go out. I remember one time uh, taking a big hit off my bong and then running down the stairs to get the mail because that's the only way I could get the mail. And I bumped into the mailman and exhaled and I'm like, Oh my God, I can never get the mail now. Like I blew my one thing I could do. And then I'd go back up and, and drink. And also my husband was going to leave me. So uh, I remember like one time uh, I was a bad drunk and I was waiting for him to come home. And I thought, I wonder if I have time to, to, to pour myself a drink. And I thought, no, I'll have to drink it from the bottle. And I'm drinking it. The bottle smashes. There's red wine everywhere. And turns out I had enough time because the guy never came home that night. He said, yeah, if you were such a drunk, I'd come home. And I said, sorry. So I think that was pretty painful. And then I also felt I was um, with a guy once accidentally. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, it was uh, uh, accidentally. Sorry. Well, I couldn't be alone. Oh, I So okay. just the one time I would go, uh, go out, I'd usually come home with someone, like takeout, you know, only I'd bring home a guy and he'd stay. <laughs> You know, um, so uh, one time, was it the mailman? So it wasn't the mailman, was it? No, oh, okay, oh. no, no. Um, it was a, a guy at a bar. Oh. He said he was British, but then I found he was really from San Diego when his mother called. <laughs> oh my god! I was gullible. So wait, where was I going with so, the going oh, out to oh, get a guy? Oh, uh, so you were saying something about the agoraphobia. Agoraphobia, but you said. I would see. I got sidetracked because I was going to ask you what happened. Hey, GD, this makes me a good writer, but not such a great interview. Well, no, no. I love the stories. The, the mailman when you exhaled on him. Oh. What happened? What, did you ever have to? See oh, him I don't again? know. I just died a little. Oh, went you never home saw and never him came again. out again. Okay, I see. Yeah, no, no. I never saw him again, or I don't think I did. But I was already a little drunk at the time, or I wouldn't have mistimed it. Right, but, but you went was, to a bar. You said you always oh you would bring home takeout. Yes, and they were but what mad. was the initial question? Perhaps that'll get oh, us back. Oh, the uh, the most difficult, painful memories oh. of being an addict. Oh yes, I remember now. Thank you. Okay, no wonder I pushed it out. I turned to <laughs> comedy, sorry, comedy I'm wellness. Sorry. Okay, okay. One time, I was with a guy who I'm the the one who pretended he was British. Uh, he hit me. And I, w I locked myself in the bathroom. I was in the bathtub and I was shaking and I said, Ma, I found my own Nazis, you know, I made, how could, I made my own Holocaust. I'm like in the bathroom, I was, you know, and he tried to get me deported. Oh my goodness. So um, I think that that was probably a low. I was kind of used to throwing up in bathrooms all over town. Um, I, cause that's how I drank. I drank to the point of blacking out. I rarely remembered the end of the evening or looked the same <laughs> than I did at the beginning of the evening. Yeah. So, um, but I never learned. I never stopped until I was able to find some meetings where people were, I walked in and they, here were people sharing it. You threw up on at, in Spagos too? Oh my goodness. What else? Some horrible, <laughs> embarrassing things have you done? The same things that I did. Right. You know, they found the men, they found the booze, they found the drugs and they were, they were like sober now. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep coming back. You know, this is, the, yeah, yeah, this is, this is something I have to learn. I have to read up on, but I didn't. Uh, okay. So the next day they said, you see, you can't share at a meeting unless you have 24 hours of sobriety. And I, I was like, a, I'm Canadian, a good little alcoholic. You know, I wasn't going to do that. So I thought, how am I going to get 24 hours of sobriety? I thought, okay, because my plan was to go to one meeting, go home and drink myself to death. Not, not all at once, just eventually, because I had already had a bad liver report at 26. 
at UCLA, they, they told me my liver was going, I had a bad liver panel. And they told me to stop doing everything. I'm like, I went home and got so drunk because I thought, oh my God, this is going to kill my mother, the Holocaust survivor. I'm going to die before her. Anyway, so I got really, really drunk, you know. <clears throat> so um, I, I thought, okay, how am I going to get through this 24 hours so I can share? And um, I was even offered cocaine. And it was incredible. I just thought, no, I must share. I must share once before I die. I can always die later. So I thought, okay, just get through the night, get through the night. And I did. And I went to my next meeting and I shared for the first time, but put up my hand and I'm like, you guys are taking cakes and chips for like 10 years. I can't get 10 minutes. How do you do it? And this little old lady who's probably about 10 years younger than me turns around and goes, oh honey, we do it one day at a time. I'm like, like the sitcom, <laughs> heavy. <laughs> okay, I am going to try this. And I just kept going to a lot of meetings and here we are 36 years later, still sober because you know, I, I learned, uh, first of all, I didn't realize the guy that I was living with was bald and I didn't know he wore a weave. Oh, how did you find out? Well, it occurred to me, his hair was like unusually thick. You know that I'm sober. I was like getting a new pair of glasses. There's actually a book like that. So one night when he, he's kept drinking heavily. So I'm sober. I'm like obsessed with his hair. That was just, <laughs> so I was going to like, I'm going to find out what's under there. So I, I, I crawl over there very quietly and I lift the thing cause he'd had a whole bottle of wine and I saw it was a weave. It was like stuck on. And then I realized his eyes were open and he was looking at me and I'm like, I put it down. I went back to my side of the bed. I went back. We never spoke of it, but I thought if I didn't know my own husband was bald, what else have I been missing? I better stay sober because that would, you would think that would be obvious. What else, what else did I get wrong? It turns out a lot. I got a lot wrong. Do you think that's why storytelling is important? Because you wanted to tell your story, which was real and that is sharing in a meeting and essentially you're telling a story of either your day or your life or what you're struggling with. Yeah. And so then you get to do that with writing or creating these videos. Or Ever since I was a kid, I created the comic books. They had bubbles. I wrote my words in there. Words were always important. I've won contests for writing even as a kid. I was published as a kid. Um, always words were very important for me to express what was going on and to put them to pictures, you know, my illustrations. It gave me uh, so much more expression that just writing couldn't. But yeah, I had to be a writer. I had to tell people. Uh, one of the reasons I, I felt I survived in certain circumstances was I needed to tell someone what I went through, which I, I heard some Holocaust survivors say too. They survived because of luck and the need to tell people what went on.